Cool. Uh, thanks so much uh, for having me, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I won't get offended if you walk around and get more drinks. Uh, this is my first nanopore conference, so I don't know how thirsty you all get, but feel free to walk around. Um, so uh, we've seen some really exciting projects where the Minion can be applied outside of a conventional lab setting. That's not really surprising to most of you at this point. So there have been some really great projects sequencing um, viruses out in West Africa and in Brazil. There have been projects that we'll hear about um, more tomorrow where um, uh, folks have gone out to sequence microbial communities in the Arctic, um, also underground. Um, people have also gone to Tanzania. Um, people have gone into parks to do shotgun plant genome sequencing. So this is not really going to be new anymore to go out into the field to do sequencing. Um, but what I would like to share today is sort of portable sequencing in the context of biodiversity research. And uh, so I've gone out and I've done a bit of DNA barcoding in the field, and so I'll talk a little bit about our recent trip to Ecuador. Um, and then some future directions that I'm really excited about, um, like doing field courses, uh, citizen science projects, and local capacity building in developing countries. So when we think about biodiversity, you can really think about as the variety of life. And it's this uh, variety of different uh, animals and plants and viruses and microbes um, that really support natural ecosystems. Um, but it's also important to us too, right? It can furnish us with uh, new foods and new medicines. Um, but I also think species have intrinsic value and we should really want to understand life on this planet. And uh, what I find really fascinating is that most of life remains to be discovered, or at the very least even described in a great level of detail. So I think around 1.9 million species have been formally described to date, but this represents a tiny fraction. Maybe, I mean, we can't even estimate it really. It's 5 to 30 million perhaps have left, left to be discovered. And uh, I guess I don't want to offend microbial people, that number is probably much higher. And uh, so what I'm showing here is um, uh, I was very lucky after a master's degree, uh, I became a field biologist in the Peruvian Amazon. And so what you're looking at is an aerial shot over uh, the Peruvian Amazon, and that bottom right corner is what's called the Tambopata Research Center in southeastern Peru. And you can see some really amazing animals along the way. Uh, scarlet macaws have been intensely studied there. Uh, red howler monkeys will wake you up every morning at 6 a.m. And uh, if you're really lucky, like I was on this last trip, you can see a jaguar quickly pop out of the river um, on your way to this research center. And so while I was out there, I became really infatuated with exploring biodiversity. And uh, my background is in entomology, so it was really fun finding new little critters out there. Um, so I'd like to share some of these with you. Um, the top panel, that glowy guy, it's actually uh, a beetle larva. And so bioluminescence has evolved about three times um, within the beetles. And so what you're seeing here is uh, the larva of a beetle that produces light out of its head. And it's actually using this to attract prey. It will uh, catch... Uh, insects that are lured into that light at night and pull them in and eat them. Um, so we're not quite sure the species, um, but it's a type of click beetle larva. In that top right panel there, it's an odd-looking web tower structure. I don't know if any of you have seen pictures of this on the internet. Um, but a macaw researcher first spotted this, and it was quite peculiar looking. And uh, after recording the, the, this for a while, we realized it was a spider egg sac. So a very odd species. Uh, when we show it to experts, they still have no idea what species it is. Um, in these panels here, the middle and bottom there, you'll notice some odd little yellow bulbs and a butterfly. And so this turns out to be um, a new interaction where uh, this butterfly uses this as a host plant. And what you're looking at here is actually a rare parasitic plant. I don't know if you knew that there were plants that were parasitic, but it lives within inside the tree and those little flowers burst out once a year. It's really peculiar, um, but that was a new life history. Um, and with some genetic data back, it might also actually be a new species of butterfly, which is really exciting. Finally, in this bottom panel here is a relationship between a butterfly and ants, um, which was the first of its kind, but I co-published this where it wasn't a new species, but it was a new life history. So these were all really exciting projects, um, but it was while I was out there that I really also became interested in portable tools that could be used to, to help us study biodiversity more effectively in the tropics. And now the problem with trying to understand biodiversity, and especially if you've ever done work in the tropics, is that you can very quickly realize that there's a conservation crisis that we're undergoing. And um, so we're losing species at a faster rate than ever before today. And uh, you know, if, if you talk to evolutionary biologists, there's a typical background rate of extinctions that occurs normally. Um, but now with humans, this is occurring at levels that are like a thousand times higher than, than pre-human levels. Um, so we are in a biodiversity crisis caused by humans. And so you can see a couple of pictures here um, taken by photographer Lucas Bustamante, just of deforestation in Ecuador. And on that right panel there is a picture I actually took out of my plane one time into the Peruvian Amazon, where you kind of see that erosion away at the rainforest, which is the result of gold mining. So how do we go about describing species? Well, we can use morphological characteristics, right, um, to describe them based on their morphological features. Um, but of course, we can also use genetics to characterize species. 
So one concept that was sort of pioneered um, about a decade ago by a researcher named Paul Haber was DNA barcoding. And so this relies on using uh, short genetic markers. A very common one is a mitochondrial gene called uh, cytochrome oxidase 1. Um, but there are some other markers you can use, like 16S, um, if you're a fungal person, ITS. Um, but the idea here is using these short, conserved genetic markers for species discovery and identification. Um, and you might think, too, now that we have these really cool new sequencers that can generate very long reads, why would we even bother with short reads anymore? Um, but I think the important part is that you have a very robust reference database to compare to in the first place, right? Um, so this uh, is very important still with DNA barcoding to have a robust reference database if you're trying to describe species. Um, so for instance, an online database, the Barcode of Life Systems, houses over 5 million barcodes and over 500,000 of these um, barcode index numbers, which can be used as a proxy for species ID. But the challenge here is that you still need a molecular laboratory if you want to do any of this sequencing, right? Um, and so this can be time consuming, but it can also be quite costly. So for instance, if you're a researcher and you want to send your samples to a barcode facility like the one that's in Guelph, Canada, this can run you around six to $17 per sample um, on a Sanger sequencer that they run. So that can add up quite quickly, right? If you're trying to sequence hundreds of thousands of specimens. Um, and another point that I'd like to bring up is that in South America, primarily where I've worked with other researchers in Peru and Ecuador, is there are no sequencers within the country that are readily accessible to these researchers, um, which is not surprising, right? The typical ones cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, you need to maintain them. Um, so what researchers typically do is they ship their samples internationally. So for instance, my colleagues in Ecuador, they'll save up all their PCR products and actually mail it to South Korea to a company called Macrogen to get it sequenced. So this was kind of the idea to try and figure out what could we do with um, uh, the nanopore sequencer. Um, so what was important too is um, some of my friends who are herpetologists in Ecuador had done some of this DNA barcoding work. Um, they'll do some really great work um, as herpetologists going around Ecuador, um, taking really high quality images, um, extracting uh, DNA um, back at the lab in Quito. Um, but then again, they'll ship those out to be sequenced internationally. Um, but I, I'd like to point out um, that 16S, CITB, and ND4 are the genes that they've used to create some of these molecular phylogenies. So that was the idea here. Let, what's, let's try and take some of these existing databases and then just try and add to it while we're in the field. So this brings us to Ecuador as our case study for this portable sequencing project. And um, Ecuador is a really fantastic country. How many of you, have any of you been to Ecuador before? Special hands, so a few of you. So it's a really beautiful little country. And despite being only about 1.5% the size of South America, it's one of the most biologically diverse countries in the world. Um, so if you look at that red little pin right there just above Quito, that's where we went for this expedition. So it's a region called the Choco. It's one of the world's 25 biodiversity hotspots, um, but also an area of global conservation priority. So I really just wanted to know, um, after we'd received some funding from the National Geographic to apply, apply portable tools to sequencing projects, is could we just go out on a normal field expedition where they typically collect animals, but also do the DNA barcoding, the steps involved? So to do that, we brought out our uh, field kit, um, which could fit inside one backpack, which was really great. Um, not pictured here, but what I'll show in a couple slides are the coolers we use for the cold chain reagents and a little centrifuge. But that was basically it, right? This is all you really need for your portable laboratory. Um, and so, uh, of course, we use the uh, mini PCR right now for, um, as our portable thermocycler, and then our mini and just plugged into our laptop. And so I'm showing some clips here just to sort of take you on this expedition with us into Ecuador. And uh, it's a really beautiful place. You see some awesome animals along the way. And um, so I also wanted to show this too to kind of introduce the team beforehand. And so we have uh, Alejandro Ortega. We also have Lucas Bustamante. They co-founded a company called Tropical Herping. They're herpetologists there. Um, over there on the left is Stefan Prost, who's a buddy of mine who's a postdoc at Stanford, um, but he handled a lot of the bioinformatics. And then we have uh, David and we have Nico. And we sort of hopped in their truck um, and we went out into the field, which you can already see it's getting quite jungly. And along the way, when you pass through some of these major cities, you can already start to see some of the effects of deforestation on your way into the Choco. And this region might look a little bit jungly, but it's actually a region that's been entirely deforested, and it's actually a large palm oil plantation. Um, so it's really an area of conservation priority. And so after um, passing our trucks along this kind of precarious boat situation, uh, we, we were at our, um, this is called the Canande River, but then we were about at our field site just after this. Um, so after several hours um, and hoping that the, our flow cells would still be in good condition and all our cold chain reagents, uh, we unloaded our, uh, our trucks and our gear. Um, so this is also photography equipment that's in there in the back. And um, then you can just see sort of the habitat that we're in on the right. So what did we do? Um, right after dinner that night, we went out into the field, and that's when we started collecting for our snakes and frogs and geckos and all this fun stuff. 
Um, after sunset is a really good time because it's still quite warm, and it's a great time for activity for some of these uh, reptiles. So you can see our little viper there next to his minion for scale. <laughs> And uh, next, um, back, at, uh, back at the lodge, uh, the guys will perform, um, they'll take uh, high quality pictures of the animals, they'll take some blood samples. Um, you can see Alejandro there on the left very gently holding down that very angry viper. Um, it, was, it was dripping a lot of venom on the ground, these guys are professionals, so I wouldn't recommend just anyone do that. Um, but David over there is uh, extracting a small amount of blood sample. Um, he's also quite interested, too, in uh, venom profiles of uh, these different snakes and how those change in different localities and is interested in nanopore for that. Um, but then on the right here, you can see Alejandro gently holding down a different viper, and that's the blood sample next to its head there. And so typically what they would do is, again, collect those blood samples, um, take it back to the lab in Quito, um, perform PCR, and then mail it off. And so they can get their DNA barcode information back maybe in a few weeks or maybe in a few months if it's backed up. Um, but since we had the lab there, um, I got to work with some of the downstream processing. And so to do that, um, I just took the blood samples and used the uh, DNAZ blood and tissue kit, which is really nice because it can be kept at room temperature. And you don't need to spin down that much. I just used that small benchtop centrifuge and then performed the uh, PCR amplification just using the mini PCR um, plugged into that external battery. Um, so that all went pretty well. And so as sunset fell that first night, I was finishing up the uh, library preparation. So I had pooled those PCR amplicons into the kit, um, and then uh, was wrapping up for uh, 16S, ND4, and SITB amplicons um, to put into this library. Cool. And so then, uh, of course, loaded the flow cell. And it was really exciting to hit that button with uh, we had the Minnow offline software, which was really fun. Um, and then reads started being generated, right? And uh, it was encouraging to see that most of those were short, again, less than 1 KB, so we had our big spike there and a little bit of what looked like the control DNA. And uh, the moral here was that within 24 hours of collecting the specimens, we'd obtained a couple of those DNA barcodes, which was really exciting. And I'll show some of the steps involved with our processing downstream. Um, but I'll point out that uh, we had amplified uh, 16S and ND4, but the SITB gene didn't amplify. And that's not a result of the sequencing, but it seemed like the PCR settings since we were pulling these different amplicons on one PCR run. And so here's Stefan, um, the bioinformatics guy, uh, very hard at work in his hammock. <laughs> and uh, so he, he was working through a few of the different pipelines and platforms. Um, and uh, so played around a little bit with, um, I, I demultiplex an albacore and then gave him the samples to work on. And um, so he ran some things through nanopolish and nanofilt. And um, we tried to avoid doing anything with a rep reference-based mapping approach. Um, so we went with Canoe as our assembler. We wanted to do everything de novo um, to not introduce any bias to our Amplicon assembly. And, um, and so then aligned those in BWA and SAM tools, um, ran through nanopolish, and then trimmed them. And so I'll show the sequences in a second. But I think what's important here is we're trying to identify species. And so if you were out in the field and you had stumbled upon this guy, I don't know if there are any herpetologists in the room, but could you identify this species? It's a snake. <laughs> it's a venomous snake, so if it bit you, you might want to know a little more than that. <laughs> um, so that's the whole point, right, is can we identify this, this critter? It's actually quite a common species, so if you're a herpetologist, it will come as no surprise um, that this is the eyelash pit viper, um, Bothriacus schleglii. Um, you'll see here on the tree that there's um, a guy called Superciliaris, which is a formerly considered subspecies. Um, but this was really encouraging. Um, the fact that we had a local database and we could perform an offline blast with this consensus sequence um, to get the right hit. So that was really cool. And um, I'm just showing here with this alignment that after the fact, we just ran these same PCR products on um, a Sanger sequencer. And that had um, a perfect uh, accuracy compared to the Sanger. Um, here's a couple other critters that we sequenced. These are cute little, uh, they're called dwarf geckos. Um, but one problem with using morphological characteristics to identify species is that you have all sorts of crypsis, um, cryptic diversity. So even though uh, Alejandro, who's publishing a paper on this group, while in the field, he wasn't quite sure what these were. Um, this could be two different species. Uh, it could be a male and female that have different color patterns. Um, or perhaps one is uh, an immature, right, and its color will come in later. And so having the barcodes was really nice because we could very quickly tell that they were indeed two different species. Um, and I've left the species names off here, but the genus is Lepidobliferis, um, because Alejandro is currently working on a publication to describe some of these species. Um, so it's kind of interesting generating the data so quick, and we're like, Alejandro, we have to publish this, and he's like, we still have to wait. So it's interesting generating the data a little too fast um, for some of these publications. Um, I'll just point out down here that with some of the um, 
uh, some of the alignments, we see a little bit of error rate in the uh, holopolymer regions. Um, but maybe we can fix that with some of the new um, uh, algorithms we've heard about today. And so just as a final example to share with you all are um, a few critters that we didn't sequence in the field, but right when we returned to the lab uh, in Quito. And so here are a couple examples that I thought would be really interesting speaking with the other researchers there. Um, on the left, you see those um, uh, frisky jumbato toads. And uh, on the right is a blind snake. And so the reason we wanted to sequence these is because the toad was thought to be extinct for 30 years in Ecuador. It was once quite common, um, but it totally disappeared for over 30 years. Um, until very recently, a few months ago, Boy found uh, a population. And so he brought these um, to Ecuador, or he brought these to the University in Quito, where there's now an ex situ uh, program to repopulate them. Um, and on the right, these blind snakes are just incredibly rare, and they're um, CITES protected species. And so it was nice being able to generate these barcodes to confirm that they were the correct species, um, because it probably would have been impossible for us to get permits to actually export samples out of the country, right? Or at least in a very short time frame. So it was nice that um, we could generate that information within 24 hours for these species that need to go under conservation uh, protection programs. So where do we go from here when it comes to uh, producing portable sequencing in the context of conservation biology or biodiversity? You know, I think we've, we've shown that, yeah, you can go out and you can do DNA barcoding, but this was on relatively few samples, right? We used the 12 PCR barcoding kit. Um, so I think the ability to multiplex much more um, will be really great. And I won't say too much about it, but I reviewed a paper where they actually multiplexed over 500 DNA barcodes onto one flow cell very recently. So that's really encouraging because that drops the per barcode cost to around $1 or $2. Um, maybe even less if you put more on there. Um, so to me, that's encouraging. The MinAid might actually become a platform um, for really quickly and cheaply producing DNA barcoding for species. Um, I talked to um, someone just during the happy hour about environmental DNA, which I think will be really great for trying to process species that are difficult to find, or at least as a non-invasive method, say in water samples. Um, we've seen some uh, recent groups be funded um, in Africa to monitor for wildlife trafficking, which I think will be very important. Um, I'm really excited about uh, direct RNA and cDNA, too, to rapidly profile transcriptomes. Uh, when I'm not in the field, I'm actually back at Berkeley trying to understand uh, the genetics of how butterflies create color in their wings. Um, but we do some field work to try and collect samples, and uh, you know, we can preserve it in RNA later, but that's quite a long time for the tissue to get back, and it may degrade in that time. So I think it would be really awesome to do uh, transcriptome profiling. Um, and finally, for pathogen diagnostics um, in animal populations. So my final couple slides here are just to show you some future directions that I'm really excited about. And uh, so in the past, I've taught uh, field courses with this organization called Field Projects International. And uh, they've recently acquired some funding to create what they call the Green Lab in the Amazon. Um, so it'll be a little molecular facility based in the Amazon rainforest. And what they really want to do is institute genetic screening uh, in primate populations. So if you think you're interested in that, um, please talk to me. And I think that would be a really fun uh, project to work on. And one of the ideas is um, you know, during one of these field courses to do the sequencing in the field. Um, so I think we've seen some examples where um, uh, students at universities can do uh, these sequencing projects, and it'll be really exciting to test it out in the field. Um, and I think it's also very important to continue to collaborate with local researchers um, as a local capacity building tool. So they're not forced to now ship their samples um, out of the country, but do everything in-house. And then finally, back to that research lodge, um, which I really love that aerial shot, um, is uh, these lodges are actually owned by an ecotourism company called Rainforest Expeditions. Um, but they like involving uh, scientists to work at their lodges, as well as having their guests um, participate as citizen scientists to actually help the researchers. So in that bottom panel, I'm showing a drone, the minion, and some camera traps. And so these are actually three ongoing projects right now where different scientists use these tools out in the fields for their research, but the visiting guests get to help participate. Um, and it's nice, too, because there's not, all, all things considered, a ton of money in basic biodiversity research. But I think this might be a nice model to include more people to get excited about going out and discovering new species, which they're already doing. Um, but what we'll try in March is just to go do that in real time. So I have a lot of friends to thank um, for this really fun project. Um, here's the team uh, who is out with us. And um, in particular, Alejandro and Lucas Bustamante and the guys who um, are from Tropical Herping, um, UC Berkeley, the Universidad Indoamerica in Quito, um, as well as Stefan at Stanford, and then funding um, that supported this uh, from the National Geographic Society. So thanks so much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aaron. We've got two roving mics in the 
in the room, one here and one here. I'm going to cheat and yeah. ask a question. There you go. Arms going up. I'm going to cheat and ask a question. Aaron, yeah. what do you think the possibilities are when Smidge Iron is up and working and accessible to anyone? Uh, well, I hope you give me one because <laughs> I want to play with it. Um, no, I'm, I'm really excited about, about that um, and the Flongle as well, just as a sort of reduced... Um, reduced uh, flow cell. So those seem really exciting because they can be more cost effective and if anyone can use it, that'll be fantastic. So I think that would be a phenomenal tool to use with people um, uh, for field projects like this. Right, we've got a question in the back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nick. Hi, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, that was really cool. Um, so the question is, if you were bitten by a snake, which would be bad, <laughs> Um, but you didn't see the snake. Um, could you use um, a swab of the bite site either to identify the snake or to identify the snake's microbiome to detect that's, what it was? That's a really interesting question. You'd have to do it quickly, right? One, one of... <laughs> what? Right. One of... Um, I'm not going to do it with Illumina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, one of the things that I found quite interesting is that um, there aren't that many places that produce antivenoms. Um, and so, for instance, if you are producing an antivenom in Costa Rica from those snakes, um, you might think you're dealing with the same species of snake in Ecuador, but it may be a different species complex. And so there's very little work that's been done on profiling transcriptomes from different species complexes to see how it changes and how that might impact uh, an antivenom. Um, so that's an w open area of research that our collaborators in Ecuador would love to talk more about. And uh, yeah, maybe if you at least take a swab of it, uh, as it's slithering away after biting you, you can ID it. <laughs> Were there two questions, or was it Nick and a helper yeah. putting up a hand? <laughs> Any other questions from the back? No, well, thank you so much, Aaron. Cool, thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah.